speaking of who died, let's review, shall we? What? Mother what? Chucker, gonna... you want to come and take He's... my job? Yeah, Fine, what? let's duke it out at the numbers. All right. Hey guys, my name's Dan, and today's reaction comes from Dead Meat. This is Chucky Season 1, 2021 Kill Count. Now I can see why he decided to do all those recounts before jumping into this, because rewatching all those movies definitely made me appreciate the show just that much more considering all that happened in it, which makes me more excited to jump into this to learn more about how this movie was made, all the kills, all the actors that were involved, which is fantastic. And of course, as you can see with the length of this, it is over an hour, so please don't feel obligated to watch this all in one sitting. If if you want to come back later watch a little bit now that's just fine just make sure to have yourself some snacks some drinks so you're all ready to go with this one but before we get into it if you enjoy other kill counts i've reacted to so many of them for you and if you want to see future reactions that i do you can go right below this video click that like button the subscribe button and ring notification bell because not only that let you see past present and future reactions that i do but also helps with the youtube algorithm helps to get more eyes on my channel then go on over and support dead meat if you haven't already i'll leave a link to that channel along with many other things down in the description and without any further ado Let's go. Welcome to The Kill Count, where we tally up the victims in all our favorite horror media. I'm James H. Anise, and today we're looking at season one of the Chucky TV series, released on Sci-Fi in USA in 2021. Seven movies in, the Chucky franchise had built up an intricate and continuous lore, with its latest film, Cult of Chucky, ending in a number of intriguing cliffhangers. To continue the story, Chucky creator Don Mancini set his sights on the small screen, inspired by his time as a writer and producer on the horror series Hannibal and Channel Zero. He figured that eight hours of storytelling would let him explore the sprawling Chucky canon more than ever before, and even delve into something that fans had been asking for, the backstory of Charles Lee Ray. Mm -hmm. There was a brief hiccup in the form of the 2019 Child's Play remake. MGM still holds the rights to the original Child's Play, so they created that AI buddy doll film against oh. Mancini's wishes. He was worried that if it succeeded, Universal might pull the plug on the TV series, since audiences could get confused about multiple Chucky properties. Sure. I commiserated with his work when I covered the remake on The Kill Count, delving into a six-minute intro explaining why my loyalties lie with Don. In the end, the remake didn't cause a big enough splash to deter the Chucky series from being made. And thank Dumbala it didn't, because the ah. Chucky TV show is everything I hoped it would be. Chucky's Dave. going after kids again, but unlike Andy, Tyler, and Alice Pierce, his newest targets are middle schoolers. The young teenagers present fresh problems for him, since they're not as gullible as six to eight-year-olds. I'm your friend to the end. Get fuck with that shit. Ha! Not six years old. The tone of the show matches the subject matter. The soundtrack features hip contemporary needle drops by artists like Billie Eilish. The dialogue and acting can feel a little Riverdale or otherwise YA. Lots of hormonal romantic plot lines and young teenage angst. I'm not happy. I can't remember the last time I was. Me neither. I don't have an issue with any of that, though. I mean, Same. we've seen the cute kid shtick plenty of times before and suffered through the dumb love of young adults with Jade and Jesse. Giving True. Chucky a new demographic to mess with continues the franchise's trend of always trying something different. Plus, I think it's a great way to get a new, young audience interested in the character. This show makes Chucky modern and cool. The show takes place in 2021 and returns us to Hackensack, New Jersey, the hometown of Charles Lee Ray, previously seen at the end of Bride of Chucky. It's where Charles Lee Ray was buried with the Heart of Dumbala amulet. Interestingly enough, Andy Barkley's actor Alex Vincent also went to Hackensack High School in real life. Oh, Chucky targets a group cool. of kids who are alienated from the adults in their life, a situation he's always taken advantage of. Mm -hmm. Using psychological manipulation, he turns people against each other and exploits their personal tragedies, all with the end goal of getting one of these kids to kill somebody. Why is he peer pressuring them when he's more than capable of killing by himself? Well, little meaties, only one way to know. Mm -hmm. Let's find out and get to the kills. Hell yeah. The series begins with a point of view shot, similar to the beginning of Seed of Chucky, which itself was a reference to the beginning of Halloween. We'll check back in with this Judith Myers surrogate later though. Right now, it's Chucky time. Look at them big blue beautiful doll eyes. Chucky is purchased at a yard sale by floppy haired middle schooler, Jake Wheeler. Jake's a stand in for Chucky creator, Don Mancini, who wrote and directed this first episode and who show runs the whole TV series. 14 year old actor, Zachary Arthur, strongly resembles a young Mancini and had yeah, already cut sure his does. teeth in 
horror in the 2017 film Mom and Dad. Though Arthur's facial expressions can be a little limited sometimes, I think he's appropriately awkward for this role. Jake's bought Agreed. the good guy to use in his doll art, like Mount Dalsuvius and Good Golly Dolly over here. Before he can add Chucky's enormous big ass doll head, his dad gets home and he is not happy to see his son with a doll, no matter how plight it is. Hi, I'm Chucky and I'm your friend till the end. Heidi ho ha ha ha. Lucas Wheeler doesn't understand his son, or more likely is in denial about who he is. Maybe you could, uh... Ask a girl to a movie. It's a painful alienation for the young gay teen, especially since the family's mom died in a car accident six years ago. Lucas is the only one Jake has. The tension is worsened at a dinner with Lucas's twin brother Logan and his family, wife Bree and their son Junior. Bree is played by Lexa Doig, who was in Jason X as Final Girl Rowan. Sure and with the Wheeler brothers, we get a double performance from Devin Sawa, Kill Count veteran, thanks to Final Destination and Idle Hands. I was excited enough when I heard my boy Devin Sawa was Hell cast yeah, in man. this show. But to then find out he plays two characters who are drastically different from each other? Hell yeah, man. While he Lucas is a struggling blue collar small business owner, Logan and Bree are well off and bougie, with Junior being raised to be a track star just like his overbearing father was. You're gonna need another extracurricular. Harvard's gonna want three. Junior starts making digs about Jake being gay, bullying the kid in front of his increasingly irritated father. It's the 21st century, it's cool to be gay now. Out of frustration, Lucas breaks a glass. He's 13 years old, he doesn't know what he is. And his son's heart. 14. The breakage continues after his brother's family leaves, since Lucas takes a bat to Jake's art project. It's a hateful act that's perfectly captured in slow motion, showing how yeah. painful this is for Jake. No more dolls, Jake. Ever. I wish you were a nice dad, Devin Sawa. The only survivor of the doll apocalypse is Chucky, because goddammit, that little bastard's hard to kill. Jake finds out Chucky might be worth enough to get him into art school, so he reluctantly takes the doll to school with him to keep it safe from his dad. Jake ignores the mouth breathers and focuses on Devin Evans, a boy he has a crush on who runs the Hackensack True Crime Podcast. I'm sure you can guess who its most famous subject is. Mm -hmm. One of the most notorious serial killers in history. Charles Lee Ray. Too bad Devin's friends with Junior, and Junior sucks. Junior's dating Lexi Cross, who, like Junior, also sucks. She yep. likes to bully Jake about being poor. Being financially disadvantaged is nothing to be ashamed of, Jake. Right? That little right always gets a laugh out of me. Lexi's bullying goes cyber when she makes a GoFundMe for Jake and sends it to everyone in their class. This does not please biology teacher Ms. Fairchild, who don't take no shit. I know. Nope. can't stand the sight of blood. Pussy. Oliver, mind your fucking business. She tries to discipline Lexi, but is threatened since her mom is the mayor of Hackensack. And if you try to stop me or penalize me in any way, my parents will sue the school. That night, Jake gets a call from a potential doll buyer who's less concerned with the doll's condition than he is with its name. Is his name Chucky? Andy Barkley's anonymous phone call spurs Jake to look up good guy violence in an internet search. He finds news stories about kills from the original Child's Play trilogy. I love how all these headlines are given equal weight. In this universe, an elementary school teacher's life is just as important as a CEO's. Following Andy's advice, Jake checks the good guy's batteries, only to find that there are none, just like Andy's mom did 30 years prior. He stuffs it into a trash can, making me think of Kyle in Child's Play 2, or Sarah Pierce in Curse of Chucky, and heads to the middle school's talent show just in time to see Devin tinkling the keys, which actor Bjorg Van Arnersen actually performed in real life. Nice. The talent show is the first episode set piece, and the first time the whole cast was together on set. It's shot in a very De Palma way, possibly Mancini's biggest stylistic influence, with split screens as Lexi bullies Jake in front of the whole school. She's only stopped by the show's first appearance of Brad Dourif's voice. Hey Lexi, Lexi. Why don't you pick on someone your own size? With Brad's VO track, Chucky's back, and he tells Jake to take him on stage so he can put on a show. Mm -hmm. I'm your friend to the end. You get that now, Jake, right? Chucky's a little bastard and it fucking rules, mostly because he messes with Jake's bullies like Lexi, Junior, and that Oliver kid. Chucky as a ventriloquist puppet is a direct nod to Magic, the 1978 movie starring Anthony Hopkins. As mentioned, that movie was a big influence on Mancini, creating Chucky in the first place. Eventually, Chucky's lips get a little too loose and the principal ends his set early. Let's You're go. all a bunch of fucking assholes. Let's go. I'm out of here. That doll really knows how to sign off.
Fuck you very much. Even though he's dealing with teens in a show on basic cable, Chucky hasn't been neutered. He's still anatomically correct. Mancini knew the character needed F-bombs and gore to stay true to himself, sure. so there are plenty of both in the series. In fact, one of the first things he negotiated was the allowance of 10 fucks per episode. They make liberal use of the limit. Previously on fucking Chucky. As a fellow <laughs> fuck fan, I couldn't be happier. Jack gets home later to find a very drunk Lucas irate about his behavior at the talent show. Uh, heads up for hate stuff, cause things quickly get physical after Jake uh -huh. calls out his father's homophobia. You don't care that they think I'm weird. You just care that they know my As difficult as the scene may be to watch, it's at least yeah. partly autobiographical. Jake is gay as I am, and he was an artist and misunderstood by his more traditionally minded father. That's certainly something I have a lot of personal experience with. Jake goes to his room while Lucas learns that he's as out of liquor as his house is out of power. Nice spider shot there, echoing a similar one from Seed of Chucky. Down at the house's display of ink cartridges, since that's definitely what I think these are for real, Lucas fiddles around until the cyan's filled again, and there's once more light to see by. <laughs> In it, he sees Chucky, who is absolutely disgusted by this father's abusive tendencies towards his son. The violent vomit spray of liquor lights Lucas up like an alcoholic Christmas tree. Jake comes downstairs to find his father getting electrocuted, one eye blown out just like Jill's was in Curse. Jake doesn't even notice a creeping Chucky behind him or this cheap commercial break jump scare. Yeah! The death is blamed on misadventure due to alcohol, but it still seems suspicious to police detective Kim Evans, who we earlier saw as Devin Evans' mom. After all, Jake has a bloody nose from his dad's abuse. Use. And that doll, that fucking doll is so weird. Jake is picked sure up is, by his it? uncle Logan, who takes him back to their enormous mansion of a house. Jesus Christ, how high are their heating bills? While Aunt Bree is warm and welcoming, Junior's not pleased to be living across the hall from his cousin and his cousin's weird fucking doll. Before the first episode ends, Chucky reveals himself to Jake with a slap and a showcase of his latest incredible animatronics. Hi, I'm Chucky. And I'm your friend to the end. Heidi, oh, so good, ho. man. Ah, ah, ah. Chucky tells Jake that his dad deserved to die because he was an abusive asshole. Jake, while surprised, knows who Chucky is thanks to his earlier internet searching. You really are Charles Lee Ray. But my friends all call me Chucky. And it was Chucky's POV that we started the series with, little Charles Lee Ray in 1965. We'll learn all about Charles in flashbacks throughout the show, but one thing's clear already, this kid ain't been right from the start. Nope. Jake returns to school a week after his dad's death. Lexi is still talking shit, while Junior is more humane about his uncle. He was a drunk. It was like an accident waiting to happen. Actually, really sad. I really liked Teo Briones' performance as Junior Wheeler. It'd be easy to make this character a one-note little shitbird, but Briones gives him shades of humanity. He's also written with a lot of sympathy because of how much pressure he's under thanks to sure, his dad. Yeah. Dad, say it's not till the 15th. We don't want you getting injured a week before the most important race of your life. Devin stops Jake in the hallway to commiserate since his dad also died when he was young. He invites Jake to a Halloween party that night and says he should bring Chucky along. You two really killed the other night. At the talent show. Right now, Chucky's uh, at home, making life miserable for Annie, the Wheeler family housekeeper. If only she didn't wash all those knives blade up in the dishwasher, Chucky wouldn't have had such an easy time killing oof. this poor, innocent woman. Always yeah. gotta remind the audience that the branding is wrong. Chucky is not a good guy. Annie's not body is found by Jake and Jr., then carted away by the police. Man, Hackensack's body bag business is booming. I love the commentary here where Bree and Logan claim that Annie was like family to them, only to be unable to answer where she lives or who her family yeah. is. Detective Evans's partner, Sean Payton, openly voices his suspicions towards Jake. It gets Logan and Bree defensive of their nephew, but also maybe a little concerned? Jake is pissed at his new friend to the end for killing Annie and for reading his journal. You should just call it Devin, Devin, Devin. <laughs> but Chucky's just teasing. He's more accepting than Jake's late father. I have a queer kid. You have a kid. Gender fluid. And you're, you're cool with it. Yep. 
I'm not a monster, Jake. Chucky promises that Annie's death was an accident, but says that Jake should purposefully kill Lexi. Like his dad, she deserves it. She did tease him in front of the whole school after all. Chucky's always been manipulative, but it's easier when the kid is six years old. Jake is not six years old. Nope. Not six years old. See? That means yeah. instead of appealing to authority, Chucky's gonna have to exploit emotional insecurities. Lexi Cross is at her home, Hackensack's mayoral mansion. Her mayor mom is Michelle Cross, her dopey dad is Nathan, and her younger sister is Caroline, who's been psyched about Chucky ever since seeing him at the talent show. She's already drawing Chucky fan art. I wonder if she could draw him on a dinosaur. The Cross parents are proud of Caroline's latest interest. They have less patience for Lexi's snark. Lexi, your sister has a gift and she's better at this than you've ever been at anything in your entire life. Oh, damn. damn. Michelle tells mm -hmm. Lexi she has to take Caroline trick-or-treating, but Lexi ain't gonna let that stop her from going to Oliver's Halloween party at another absurdly large mansion. What the fuck do these parents even do? I the don't know. houses in this series are a good <laughs> reflection of its higher budget. I couldn't find any exact numbers, but it sounds like they got a lot more money than they had for Curse and Cult. I thought, wow, it's like... We've hit the big time because, you know, sometimes with those Chucky movies, they would be like, oh, you want to make another Chucky movie? Okay, here's 27 cents. And we'd be like, okay, <laughs> nobody drink the coffee. We need that money for to pay the ADR, you know? It's not just the square footage of these places either. The production design is great, done by Craig Sandals, who returns after working on the Gothic Mansion in Curse and the Blinding White Asylum in Cult. I especially liked his work at Perry Middle School, which was done up in red and black to evoke The Shining. Junior's oh. heading to Oh, party, I even noticed dressed that. like his dad in his glory days. And while Jake intends to stay at home at first, he's forced to hit the town when he realizes Chucky is gone. That little bastard is out trick-or-treating in a Hello Kitty mask. Hi, so I'm perfect. Chucky. Wanna play? He hits up a woman named Gladys Kravitz, played by Jamila Ross, giving a delightful performance. When I was your age, I was high as a kite. You have a good time. Chucky asks Gladys where the party at, because Chuck is on the way where the Bacardi at. She tells him, and as thanks, he gives her an apple with a razor blade inside. Later, she reports the trick and gives a description of Chucky's good guy outfit, furthering Detective Evans's feeling that something just ain't right. At the party, Junior finds Lexi in a bedroom and asks her to be careful of Jake. Earlier, he found her profile on his laptop, not knowing it was Chucky doing victim research. She talks down to him for trying to protect her, because Lexi is dismissive of her boy Toy. At least she has good taste in Elijah Wood horror movies. Come to daddy. Come to daddy! Jake gets to the party, worried that Chucky is there to kill Lexi. But before he can find her, he and Devin are shoved into a closet by the party host Oliver. Seven minutes in hell! That doesn't even rhyme, you dumb idiots. Devin tries to get Jake to open up to him, but Jake's issues with plastic people are too much for him to share. They're let out of hell without any fun sins having passed between them. Chucky has found Caroline and is playing video games with her. He thinks fake killing is lame, though. You can kill the housekeeper? You can kill the babysitter? You can even kill your sister. Just like he was doing with Jake, Chucky's trying to convince a kid that killing is cool. Here, he'll show them. Check out this stab through the bed. Or, uh, I mean this stab through the bed. Damn it, maybe next time. With the makeout sesh completed, Lexi changes into her Halloween costume, which turns out to be Jake's dad as he was electrocuted to death. Wow, it is hard to hate a character more than Lexi right yep. now. It's so cruel it even gives her brief pause before she gets back to yucking it up. Jake nearly leaves but comes back to confront Lexi when he sees Chucky about to attack her with a knife. Jake stops him and flees from the party with the doll back to his aunt and uncle's home. There, Chucky apologizes for hitting him earlier. I promise I will never do that again. Heard that before. Chucky's dialogue to Jake is very much that of an abuser. The show deals with bullying, obviously, which Chucky is kind of the poster doll for. Whether emotional, verbal, or physical, that little <laughs> bastard has abused and harassed countless people. And right now, his manipulation seems to be working. He reiterates that Lexi deserves to die, and Jake takes the knife to show off his blade face. Chucky chillaxes and tells Jake it'll be easy to kill Lexi with a knife. You want hard. Try choking someone with these. They are little plastic baby hands. But Jake still isn't sure that he's a killer, unlike Chucky, who's been a killer for a long time. He flashes back and reminisces about his first ever victim. You gotta find that special someone. It's the first of many times this series equates killing with sex, a metaphor mostly explored in Charles Lee Ray's backstory flashbacks, which, by the way, are done in such a fun style. They're a joy to watch. In the present, at Perry Middle School, Devin tells Jake he feels bad about Lexi's Halloween costume. I wish I could, like, 
protect you or something. Jake is thinking you can protect Dad's shoulder if you yeah. like. Yeah! After school, Jake considers his murder options for Lexi. Maybe go Grim Reaper on the gale? A little Friday Five? Ooh, some Bay of Blood, a classic. Mm -hmm. And an underrated kill count, I might add. Lexi shows up I'm at sure. Jake's murder garage asking if I'll she could have that. Chucky. Her sister Caroline has become fixated on the doll. Caroline is meant to be on the spectrum. It's never outright said, but it's pretty obvious from her behavior, which includes common symptoms like aversion to touch. I think the character is well written and well acted by the young Karina Batrick. Since Lexi actually does care about her little sister, she tries to get the doll by being nice to Jake. I love how much it seems like an apology physically pains her. Look, I'm sorry. <laughs> Look at that. I hurt your feelings. And she can't even commit to the face turn. Even though you're like a weird social yep. tumor who's creepy Turns AF, heel again. and you thought you couldn't mess with me at the talent show. Jake tells Lexi to fuck off, but take it as a win, Lex. A minute ago, he was about to murder you in a split diopter shot. In his room later, Jake regrets backing down, especially with Chucky chastising him. It's called completion anxiety. This is a callback to how Nika taunted mm -hmm. Chucky in Curse over his failure to kill Andy Barkley. You know it's called completion anxiety. It's very common in males. Chucky says he can take care of Lexi for Jake. Just give him the knife and drop him off at the cross house. Easy peasy. Here you go, Caroline. Is there a leaking balloon somewhere? Seriously, By doing this, Jake has taken so a significant step towards being a murder accomplice. He starts to have regrets later during a cemetery visit. What would your dead mom say, Jake? Or your dead dad? Eh, never mind. Fuck that guy. Even yep. if he's not the worst person buried in the cemetery. True. The cross parents are out for the night, so Lexi has a party with a bunch of kids, a bunch of booze, and one Chucky doll. Nothing could go wrong. The party not. is a silent disco with everyone listening to the same song on headphones. From the outside, it's like that Beach Boy Shred video. <laughs> Lexi shows a shred of humanity when she agrees to sing Caroline to sleep. Hilariously, it's Blue Oyster Cult's Don't Fear the Reaper. That's so weird. Seasons don't fear the reaper, nor do the wind, the sun, or the rain. Aw, that was real nice, Lexi. Think it'll keep Chucky from killing you? Hey, kid. Nope. I'm gonna go kill your sister. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> Wanna come? I guess not. Chucky oh. gets his stab on, but it's not Lexi like he thinks. It's that kid Oliver. Oh, shit. <laughs> My bad. Doesn't really matter to him though. He repeatedly stabs Oliver in the back and side. This isn't the best looking attack. Some of those look like the stab equivalents of Shane McMahon's punches. But cumulatively, yes! they get the job done. <laughs> After more than 30 of them, agree more Oliver is dead. Another flashback takes us to a time when young Charles Lee Ray awoke to a commotion in the house. A serial killer, reported earlier on the radio, had broken into their home and murdered Charles's father Peter with repeated stabbings to the chest. Charles and his mother Elizabeth fled upstairs and hid in a closet Laurie Strode style. The Hackensack slasher followed to finish off the job, only to open the closet and find that the work was already done for him. I helped. You got guts, kid. Yep, Charles Lee Ray's first victim was his own mother, and with some encouragement from a professional, he learned his true calling that day. So that's Charles's backstory. He wasn't abused or mistreated as a kid. Nope. Instead, similar to Michael Myers, he had a loving family and comfortable middle-class life. He's a sociopath, and, and that's how he was born. This kid was gonna be a killer no matter what. Straight from the man himself. Chucky was gonna be a killer. No matter what! Lexi takes a breather from the party to smoke a J. Chucky jumps on her back, doing the Chucky flail we know and love, and the sparks from her joint cause a fire to erupt. Chucky reveals himself to Lexi against this flaming backdrop, with words so harsh, even the Blu-ray bleeps them. This is for Jake. You fucking little Chucky, you are just the little tyrant king of nastiness. Also, sure all y'all kids ain't feel that heat. Looks like that fireball was a practical explosion, comped into a separate shot of the kids dancing. The shot of fire racing across the banister is an homage to the changeling, previously referenced in Curse of Chucky, with the eyeball bouncing down the stairs. Oh, yeah. We never see the conclusion of Chucky's fiery attack, and that's always disappointed me. Instead, we go to the hospital, where Jake sees the consequences of his actions. Mostly, a lot of teens on ventilators. At least Devin seems okay. Hi. Hi. Lexi shook because now she knows the truth. Chucky did it. Okay, but like, how'd you escape his attack? How? Yeah, that's what I'm asking. Yeah, you know, in all the Chucky movies, they never really dwell on a person's incredulous reaction to the reality of a talking doll. I like that we get that with Lexi here, until she ultimately comes to the usual conclusion. What a dick. She gets pissed at Jake for sending Chucky to kill her, which also got her little sister hospitalized. But her parents blame her for the fire, and everyone else will probably think that her doll tale's a tall tale. She's forced to partner up with Jake so they can figure out how to stop the doll from killing her successfully. A 
hospital lobby parent meeting devolves into an argument, since Logan blames Lexi and the Cross family for the fire that damaged his son's lungs. It's a great interception of these characters. Just, just back off a second, okay? Oh. Shit, look who decided to show up. I'm glad the Chucky series has compelling adult characters to go alongside the kids. I especially enjoy the dynamic between the wheelers and how Logan needs Junior to love cross country like he did. I want to hear it. I love cross country. Boy. Since Detective Evans keeps grilling her kid about Jake's doll, he uses the internet to look up pictures of Jennifer Tilly. Or, sorry, learn about Chucky and his past. Oh, yeah. hi, Nika. This segues into another flashback, one that takes place when Charles Lee Ray was at an orphanage in the 70s. Great updated fashion and color palette from the previous episode's flashbacks in the 60s. Props to costume designer Catherine Ashton oh, yeah. for finding authentic vintage threads. Or are they retro? Charles manipulated the younger kids at the orphanage and led them on a standby me quest to find a dead body. It's a janitor who worked there, whose throat Charles has slit, and whose hand has been cut off so he can be the Captain Hook to Charles's Peter Pan. Two of the kids flee, but one stick poking bastard earns Charles's respect. He repeats what the Hackensack Slasher once told him. You got guts, kid. <laughs> Whoa, what the fuck was that? Weird fucking decision there. We knew that was Chucky already, so, uh, I don't know. I guess they were just having a little fun. Later, we see that the janitor's I'm death okay caused it. Charles Lee Ray to flee the orphanage, but not before he left a gift for his kid protege. The gift was the janitor's hand, and that kid was Albert Einstein. Just kidding, he was someone else. Eddie Caputo. Haha, <laughs> that's right! The Chucky mm -hmm. series gives us an origin story for Eddie Caputo, Charles Lee Ray's accomplice the night he was gunned down in a toy store, and one of his earliest victims as a doll. Yep. Jake and Lexi sneak into her burnt-out shell of a mayor's mansion to see if Chucky's still there. While they search, they argue about the conflicts between them. You went straight to murder? You dressed up as my dead dad in front of everyone. Yeah, both those things, uh, pretty fucked up. The argument yep. ends up accidentally pushing Lexi over the edge in an homage to North by Northwest. Jake catches her on the way down, but that's when a fucked up Chuck up and emerges from the shadows. Mancini loves finding new damaged appearances for Chucky to have. Old Burnt Boy tells Jake that all he has to do is let go. The world's gonna be better off without it. Just one less little vicious Karen on training wheels. Jake says, no, he's not a killer, and he pulls Lexi up while the doll does his best to reach her. <laughs> Sorry, not a chance, Chuck. The doll becomes still when Detective Peyton walks in and tells the kids to come with him back to the hospital. He'll take Chucky, too, since Detective Evans has been asking about it. Ugly fucking doll, if you ask me. They get to the hospital, where Jake is pulled aside by Detective Evans. Lexi thanks Jake for not letting go, solidifying their unlikely friendship. Mm -hmm. It's nice to see them on good terms. Actors Zachary Arthur and Olivia Allen Lind had actually known each other for eight years already, since oh. they were both on Transparent back when they were real young. Like oh, nice! Five years old or some shit. Lexi looks That's for crazy. Chucky in the hospital, only to run into Devin, who says he learned about Chucky on the internet, so it must be true. Together, they determine that Chucky the doll is possessed by Hackensack's most infamous killer, Charles Lee Ray, aka the Lakeshore Strangler. But he never really strangled anyone. He was more of like a mangler. Yo, that's what I've been saying. He's much more of a stabber. Detective Peyton takes Chucky into Caroline's room, then ransacks the snack rack. Chucky knows those are meant for Caroline, so he throws a scalpel into Peyton's back. Oh, uh, wait, no, dude, don't fall back. Oh, no! Oh! Straight through the spine, oh! paralyzing him. It's yeah. a much more graphic version of the attack on Sullivan in Child's Play 3. Chucky sticks his hand into a needle bucket and takes advantage of Peyton's immobility. You might feel a little prick. He proceeds to go nutso with mm -hmm. the needles, mincing dab, Peyton's dab, chest dab, and dab, injecting dab, him with dab, a whole dab, bunch dab, of dab. drugs. The cocktail makes him bleed out like Eleven was killing him with her mind. God, I love hospitals. Chucky pulls a plug, and an alarm brings everyone to Caroline's room, where they quickly fix the issue, but also discover Peyton's body. That is not proper needle disposal. But nope. then again, you know Chucky. He's never been a proper lad, has he, kids? Another set of flashbacks jumps forward another decade. Now the film projector transition and grainy look of the 60s and 70s is replaced with VCR tracking and an interlaced video appearance for the 80s. Charles Lee Ray is looking more like we remember him from the first movie. In other words, very we so. He sees a chick named Delilah who's too aggro for her mans to handle, so Charles makes his move. It's a shame your friend had to run off like that. In one of my favorite parts of the show, flashback Charles Lee Ray is played by Fiona Doroth, who of course plays Nika Pierce. Fiona is also, oh. of course, the daughter of Brad Doroth, the original actor for Charles Lee Ray, and who provides the speaking voice that Fiona lip syncs to in these flashbacks. I promise you, 
I'm not like anybody else. This is hilarious on so many levels. Sure is. In Cult, Fiona had to play Nika, possessed by Charles Lee Ray. In other words, she had to play her dad in spirit, and now she's doing it physically. It's also funny that I her even dad noticed. played Ray, and then she played Ray, and now they're playing Ray together. Finally, the casting Pretty awesome. with how the Chucky franchise is always playing around with gender. It Hell also yeah. seemed very on brand for our franchise, having Fiona Dorif, a woman, playing a cis male role. Role. Fiona already resembles her dad a lot, so all they had to do was apply minor prosthetics to her nose and chin and make her eyebrows a little bushier. She was honored to take on the role, though acknowledged how strange it was to play her dad. It was so weird. It was so weird. Sure. <laughs> That's all I got, it was weird. Charles and Delilah pick up she another woman, who they take to the Hotel Hackensack for HLA. Literally. When Charles breaks out a knife, the new girl doesn't skip a beat. Do it. Do it to me. Now. That gets Charles excited, but it's too much for Delilah. He responds by stabbing her in the chest, then hands the knife over to his new gal pal, who stabs Delilah until she gives herself an orgasm and a vocal cord transplant. It's never happened like that before. <laughs> Is that me? Yep, this is young Tiffany Valentine, played by Blaze Crocker, lip syncing to Jennifer Tilly's voice. Sometimes it doesn't work perfectly. Boy, you really know how to show a girl a good time. <laughs> but I'm still excited to see this backstory. Blaze Crocker is half Asian, just like Jennifer Tilly is half Chinese. That helped mm -hmm. Tilly deal with the fact that someone else was now playing her favorite character. Well, I always knew this day was coming when they bring in a younger Tiffany. <laughs> in present day, Chucky and Tiffany return to the Hackensack Hotel. This Chucky being the one in Nika's body, as per the end of Cult. I call him Chuck Nika. Rolls right off the tongue. Chuck Nika's new body hasn't deterred Tiffany's lust nor her bloodlust, seeing as how there's the body of a bald dude on the floor of their suite. There's also a live dude, tied up, who has to bear witness as Tiffany and Chucky fall into their usual arguments. My mother always told me, never let a man cock block you from what really makes you happy. And eating makes me happy! I love everything about this, from Jennifer Tilly getting to ham it up, to Fiona Dorif embodying a very male attitude now that she's playing Chucky. She and Tilly said it felt natural to perform their love scenes together, since they have so much chemistry in real life. A shift happens after Tiffany steps out, and Chuck Nika sees blood on the knife blade. Chucky falls to the ground and wakes up as Nika Pierce, unable to walk and very confused about her present situation. Maybe not as confused as their captive, though. I'm not a Killer. You don't understand. Are you fucking serious right now? I watched you murder. She gives the guy and the audience a little recap of her two films, the murder of her family in Curse and her time at the psych ward in Cult. That adventure culminated in Chucky splitting his soul and putting one of the pieces in her body. Nika tries to help her captive escape, but gets a backhand in return, knocking her out as Tiffany comes back to find her on the floor. Wait, sorry, find him on the floor, because mm -hmm. thanks to that attack, Chucky's back. And Chucky doesn't want to let Tiffany know about this latest development. Best if we keep this Nika bullshit between us, huh? Damn, Chucky, Ooh. that's cold. Guy almost got away. Caroline finally wakes up in the hospital, sounding like a good gal doll. I like to be hugged. She's not a fan of Chucky's left on the stove too long look, so her dad Nathan tosses him down the garbage chute. Hope he doesn't get picked up by a Jack Black looking dude. He lands in a pile of mmm drugs and winds up looking like something out of Meet the Feebles. God, I love hospitals. Later, the kids check for him in the saw tooth syringe pit, but it's too late. The doll is out of pocket again. They try to figure out what to do next during bio class, where Junior notices the new best friends trio. Sorry, man, you've got to give the people what they want. Jake mm -hmm. asks if they should include his cousin, and Devin says they should, but Lexi shoots down the idea. No, no, we can't bring him into this. He doesn't have the imagination. Oh my God, that's so sad, and also probably true. Have yep. you guys seen Westworld? It's a crazy theme park with these hot robots and you can like do anything you want to them. Oh, Junior, you poor center-parted bastard. Jake's feeling guilty over Oliver's death, but hey, it's not all bad as long as he gets to hold hands with Devin. That kid can slow down time, apparently. Holy shit, he's an X-Man. At home soot home, Michelle grounds Lexi. She is done with her daughter's shit. I won't with her anymore. Every time she speaks, it's 
cheap silver on a mass-produced dinner plate. I love the chemistry between Olivia Allen Lind and her real-life actor mom, Barbara Allen Woods. I'm just proud of her. It fits with the franchise's familial elements behind the scenes. Also, if their names sound familiar, it's because there's a whole damn clan of them. Olivia's older sisters are Natalie Allen Lind and Emily Allen Lind, the latter having been in both Babysitter movies and as Snakebite Andy in Doctor Sleep. Oh, damn! As for Nathan Cross, if he looks familiar, okay. it's because he's played by Michael Terrio, who was in Cult of Chucky as the awful abuser Dr. Foley. I've missed these little sessions of ours. His mild-mannered father figure here is a nice 180 from that role. He tries mm -hmm. to please Caroline with a new good guy doll who rocks the standard new good guy name. Hi, I'm Tommy. Wanna play? Caroline hugs Tommy as a melted wet Chucky Russell Crowe's through the window. Never feels good to get replaced by someone who's got, you know, their full face still intact. Later, yeah. Nathan finds the half-melted Chucky doll on the floor of Caroline's room, and Lexi sees him take it out to the trash. Damn, Chucky, how many times are you gonna get thrown away? Lexi calls Jake and Devin over, and together, they bag the doll, tase it up the ass, and stomp it into literal pieces. The day is saved! Chucky is no more! Goal! And as for Tommy, he should be safe. Earlier, Lexi gave him the tried and true Are You a Living Doll test. Jake and Devin take a dusky bike ride to a hilltop where they celebrate with their first ever kiss. Aww. Ooh, and their second ever kiss. Careful now, boys, don't topple over. Jake's first kiss was not autobiographical, but Mancini says it's the first kiss he wishes he had had. Aww. Later, they filter into the school auditorium along with the rest of the town for an assembly with Principal McVeigh. Mayor Michelle kicks off the assembly by declaring that Hackensack is safe, but when they try to bring out Principal McVeigh, we uh -oh. instead hear a synthy opening uh -oh. to a Yeah 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 song. Anyone familiar with the lyrics knows what's coming next. Principal McVeigh's head rolls out onto the stage with one last blink and a split diopter shot that this series loves so much. And the rolling head isn't enough of a showcase kill for Chucky, who also reveals the headless body. Great job, Chuck. Two thumbs up. Turns out Melty Chucky came into Caroline's room last night to deliver the show's first incantation recitation. Ah, day do we Dembella. Give me the power, I beg of you. It transferred his soul into the Tommy doll after Lexi's beating and before Nathan grabbed the old one, meaning the kid smashed apart a doll body that Chucky's soul had already vacated. Now we're at episode six, which really starts the end game of season one. Tiffany Valentine voices the opening recap and reminds us that in 2004, she took over Jennifer Tilly's body. Anyhow, lots to get to. Television is so exciting. Mm. Tiffany's not the only one who's back. In South Carolina, Andy Barkley and his foster sister Kyle are posing as census takers. Nice to see a now 40-year-old Alex Vincent yet again, as well as Christina Lee returning as Kyle after her cameo in Colt's post credit scene. They're hunting down Chuckies, since that bastard's soul shards have been scattered all over the place. What do we think? Do we got one here? Hi, I'm Charlie. Um, y'all saw that, right? And yep. he did, and his suspicions are quickly proven correct. You made me do this. Before Chuck can hurt the kid, Andy does it for him, blowing out her eardrums for life. Together, Andy and Kyle go full boondock saints on the Chucky doll, filling this poor family's home with bullets and doll blood and guts. And drama! Great way to introduce these characters to the TV show. And I think Alex Vincent's acting has improved a bit since Cult. He didn't act for most of his life, but it helps that Mancini knows how to write for him. They talk about their childhood and the Chucky head that Andy tortured for four years straight. It's sad, but realistic, that Andy is permanently scarred from the original trilogy. Sure, makes sense. What'd you learn? He screams the loudest at fire. <laughs> Screams are my favorite. Not concerning at all. Nope. According to their math, besides <laughs> Chuck Nika, there's only one more Chucky doll to kill, meaning I guess Andy took care of one-armed dirty babby Chucky, who was left in the asylum at the end of Cult. At the Hotel Hackensack, Tiffany is having a hard time giving these bodies the Damien disposal treatment. Chuck Nika criticizes her technique. The key is smaller pieces for optimal packing. Oh, so now you're a packing genius. Smaller pieces, is that what you suggest? It's like... Rolling your t-shirts instead of folding. Shut up, Chucky! Tiffany hacks off a hand, shooting blood into Chuck Nika's face, which once again reverts them to Nika form and sends her crashing to the ground. She's still Nika when it's time to play poker, which has got to be terrifying when your opponent is Jennifer Tilly. Playing cards with Jennifer is terrifying. Thought so. Chelsea and I are huge poker fans. The first piece of furniture Same. we bought for our house was a custom-built poker table. We love that Jennifer Tilly won yeah, the I was just about to say that. event at the World Series of Poker in 2005. It was the first 
first time a celebrity ever won a bracelet. A suspicious tip. And she's also in, in, I think, either is dating or was dating um, a, 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 fa a very famous uh, poker player. He grills Nika, giving Fiona Doroth another scene of incredible acting. She has to play Nika Pierce, pretending to be Charles Lee Ray inside of Nika Pierce's body. That means she has to do Nika's impression of the voice Fiona uses when she's Charles Lee Ray. How does my voice change so that it's Nika pretending to be Chucky that's reasonable enough and sounds enough like Chucky that doesn't make uh, Jennifer an idiot. That is a lot for an actor to consider. Sure. But as always, Ms. Dorith is awesome. Come on, Tiff. That was a long time ago. Raise you a hundred. Her best isn't good enough to fool Tiffany, though. Hello, Nika. Sorry, Nika. You really tried, but Tiffany's too damn wild. Yeah. I stabbed you in the thigh ten minutes ago. You didn't feel a thing. Tiffany admits that she prefers when Chuck Nika drops the Chuck and keeps the Nika. Sometimes... When we're together, I, I see you looking at me, and I know it's you. This franchise is such a soap opera, and I love it. Tiffany tells Nika that she's bought a house for them here in Hackensack, but since she doesn't want Chucky to come out and play again, she knocks Nika out for safekeeping. Turns out Tiffany bought Charles Lee Ray's old home from Gladys Kravitz, who's a realtor. The house has been empty since the 1960s. Ever since the murders, yeah. Speaking of murders, here's a good guy sized box, Tiffany's first hack and sack delivery. Her second is in the trunk, a tied up Nika Pierce, whom Tiffany puts inside and kisses goodbye as she leaves to run errands. Back in 1987, we see Chucky and Tiffany buy a car. It's a red 1960 Pontiac Parisian, which we saw in Bride of Chucky and also at the end of Cult of Chucky. Oh, yeah! Damn, even Tiffany's car gets a backstory? What is this, a Stephen King novel? We also learn yes. where Chucky picked up one of his favorite phrases. And a true classic never goes out of style. A true classic never goes out of style. The killer couple signs the dotted line with a nail file throat slit that sprays the salesman's blood all over the windshield. This may be the first time Tiffany ever performed her patented kill. She takes the wheel while Chucky reads about his latest interest. This is 1987 after all. The very next year, he'd be using an incantation for some plastification. During a bio class, Detective Evans barges in and arrests Ms. Fairchild for the murders of the principal, the detective, and uh, that Oliver kid. This whole Fairchild as a suspect thing feels like it comes out of nowhere, but mm -hmm. it does make the kids feel guilty and gives them more urgency to act. They know Chucky's out there, and since Tommy's missing now, Tommy must be Chucky. Let's go find the little rug rat. They learn about Andy Barkley, who was in the news just two weeks ago. Violent patient escapes Harrogate Psychiatric Hospital. So I guess his cliffhanger ending in cult is mostly just brushed aside. Jake remembers the phone call from the first episode and realizes it must have been Chucky's OG pal. They call Andy back, who says he and Kyle will come help as soon as they can make the drive up from Virginia. So throughout the show, Brie Wheeler has been shown to be keeping a secret. At first, it seems like it might be the standard infidelity, but in the previous episode, we learned the truth. It was something far more tragic. Stage four cancer. You know I say the words and it still doesn't feel real. Now Brie has to break the news to her family, and to be honest, I don't like dealing with illness in most horror movies. It brings down the mood, man. It's, yeah. it's just too real. Junior yeah. tells Lexi he feels like everything's falling apart. When she's too distracted to offer emotional support, he ends the relationship, further isolating himself. Junior goes with his mom to her next therapy session and waits in the car while she heads inside. Oh, Brie boy. tells her therapist that she's going to refuse cancer treatment and instead make the most of the time that she has left. She leaves the session as Shade's trampoline comes on the soundtrack, and I will forever associate that song with this scene, because mm -hmm. it's something else, man. Yeah. Turns out Chucky hitched a ride to the shrink and has a nasty trick up his little rainbow sleeves. He pushes a cart slowly but surely until it's at ramming speed! Bree turns around just in time to be horrified before she's sent crashing through the high-rise oh. window. Chucky, you cheeky fuck, don't give me that coy bullshit! Yeah. Bree was one of the most decent characters on the show, and thanks yeah. to you, we have to kiss her goodbye. Yeah. The kill is beautifully shot, but it horrifically really traumatic for Junior. Well, at least he gets one last face-to-face -face with her. I oh, think Bree's death God. is the most impactful of the series, and I don't mean that in a punny way. She was the only one with whom Junior had a positive, loving relationship. Now that she's gone, he's completely alone, which makes him vulnerable. It's also a bummer for us, the viewer, since Lexa Doig is such a joy. She did a damn good job selling that fall she in sure front did. of a green screen with some fans. Bree's therapist chalks up her death as a suicide, which devastates Logan and Junior. Jake tries to tell Junior his mom didn't kill herself, but his cousin blames him for his family's misfortunes. Devin talks to his mom about Jake, officially coming out as gay to her. This doesn't change anything. 
You're my son. And I'll always love you. Aw, that's nice. Yeah. He joins Jake and Lexi at Junior's home, where they lay a trap for Chucky inspired by Martin Scorsese's Cape Fear. All this fishing line booby trapping is the perfect kind of 80s hijinks to drive two people close together. Ooh, especially when it gets spooky. They realize Chucky's come in through the fireplace. That never happened in Cape Fear. Nah, but it did happen in Child's Play 1. Do sure your research, kids! Chucky finds Lexi alone upstairs and says he won't kill her if she kills Jake. Chucky needs a kid to kill somebody! She feigns interest long enough for Jake to batter up. And though Chucky slides away from that attack, Ooh. he gets tased like a bitch by Devin. Having a police mom sure does come in handy. Chucky charges Devin, but runs straight past him, cause he's not trying to kill these kids. Instead, he wants to further isolate them by killing their parents, like Detective Evans, who just showed up looking for them. Chucky jumps on her and oh, swings no. around until she falls down the stairs, oh. at which point she breaks her neck. Oh. He runs away, leaving yet another kid traumatized by a dead parent. That doll sure knows how to create memories. Sure Awake does. is held for Bree at Junior's home, but she's not the only thing that's dead. Because of his mother's murder, Devin quits the three Chucksketeers. He breaks up with Jake to make it extra official. We're not good together. Junior comes outside and punches Jake out of anger, and more chaos is introduced when Tiffany Valentine arrives in Jennifer Tilly's body. She walks up to Logan and makes out with him in front of everyone, including his bewildered son. Why'd she do this? Mancini and Tilly say Tiffany honestly doesn't know. She's just lighting fires and seeing what'll happen, which is actually how this show's whole story began in the first place. In the first episode, a woman in a red coat leaves the yard sale right before Jake finds Chucky. That was meant to be Tiffany, dropping oh! off the doll so it could get into some trouble. I now, I haven't that. yet mentioned something that Kill Count fans are used to hearing. The title card! Each episode features the word Chucky being made out of objects relevant to its plot. For instance, syringes and the one where Sean Payton gets cocktailed to death. Episode 7's has gravestones thanks to all the dead parents, but I wanted to mention it because of some of the other names I see. There's Sarah Pierce from Curse, Tony Gardner from Seed, Grace oh. Poole from Child's Play 2, and Howard Fitzwater, who I had to look up because I forgot it was the birth name of Damian Baylock from Bride. From yeah. Redman to Eddie Caputo, this title card is full of Easter eggs for fans of the That's franchise. Phenomenal. The music played each time is a nice take on the theme from Child's Play 2, but of course I can't include a clip or else it'll get me a copyright claim. Sure will. Another flashback puts us in Chicago, 1988, butting right up against when we saw Chucky's story begin about 30 years ago. Charles and Tiff have moved here from Hackensack after driving off in her Pontiac, and you know a new place needs to be christened with sex, pizza, and blood. Specifically, blood from the pizza delivery every guy. Sorry, dude. Here's a tip. Don't deliver pizza to killers. The honeymoon doesn't last, and eventually Tiff comes home to the sound of a woman groaning. Chucky's been cheating. He's been killing without her. Believe it or not, Tiff, I got a life outside of you in this dump. But killing is an us thing. Chucky says Tiff is a nag, so he leaves for a night out on his own. Later, we see how an angry Tiffany got revenge with a phone call. I'd like to speak to Detective Mike Norris, please. Yep, Tiffany tipped off Detective Norris, leading to the chase that ended with Chucky transferring his soul into a good guy doll. Mancini says he thought of this twist 10 years prior, back when he was writing Curse of Chucky. Speaking of Curse, you may be wondering, like I am, how this fits in with that movie's flashbacks. There, we saw Chucky imply that Nika's mom, Sarah, had somehow called the cops on him while he was keeping her in his flower shop. Yeah. He left that place and wound up in the chase that opened the first movie. Personally, I think the TV series explanation explanation works better. And unfortunately, there's no elaboration of how or if Sarah fits in with this new info. Was Charles keeping her as a captive side piece? Cause he looked pretty obsessed in Curse. Much yeah. different than the cool detached killer he is in the show. I wish there had been a line from Tiffany saying she knew about Chucky's other obsession or something, but maybe, somehow, season two will better smooth over this wrinkle yeah, in continuity. Mayor that. Cross holds a press conference saying everything's fine now. Miss Fairchild's been arrested, so no more deaths to worry about. To celebrate their success, she's holding a charity screening of Frankenstein. Hey, that was a kill count one time. It sure a, uh, was. Pretty early one. Reporters grill Mayor Cross and even pitch a question to her youngest. Caroline, do you want to be mayor one day? Chucky told me to kill mommy. <laughs> that shit Whoops. would go so viral. Andy and Kyle sure are still would. headed north when they need to pull off her gas. Andy takes the opportunity to lock Kyle out and leave her so Chucky can't hurt her. He knows all about how hurtful Chucky can be. Just look at how hurt the wheelers are in the wake of Bree's death. Junior mm -hmm. finds Chucky in his bedroom, and the doll reveals himself so he can try to turn Junior against his dad. Kid, the guy's an asshole. 
The kid is upset about Logan making out with another woman at his mom's wake, and Chucky exploits that anger, meaning Tiffany's chaos gambit pays off once again. The doll tells Junior to kill his dad, saying that it's something his cousin Jake couldn't do. But you're better than him, aren't you, Junior? Maybe he is, Chuck. Maybe he is. Mm -hmm. Tiffany visits Junior, saying she's cooked his father's favorite meal. Swedish meatballs. I love how that's Tiffany's go-to recipe. She mentioned them in Bride. I made Swedish meatballs, your favorite. And earlier in the season. Swedish meatballs. She even talks about them in the house tour promotional video for season two. I cook, um... Swedish meatballs. It's one of her quirks, like always quoting her mother, that makes Tiffany so delightful. That and her constant references to her favorite Jennifer Tilly movie. I know you. <laughs> Aren't you a little young to have seen Bound? Tiffany implies she had been having an affair with Junior's dad, and he starts thinking maybe that led to his mom's apparent suicide. Having done enough damage for now, Tiffany leaves him to his own devices. Out of curiosity, and maybe even potential revenge for his mother, Devin decides to check out Charles Lee Ray's old home. The taser can come too. He goes there by himself and smashes a window to get inside. Damn, kid, your mom would arrest you for that if she wasn't dead. Nika hears Devin and calls out for help, so he finds and unties her from the chair. But wait a minute, Nika can't stand. Son of a bitch! It's mm -hmm. Chucky. Sorry, Dev. If you're keeping track, your punch card should be filled now. We've seen Fiona Dorif play Nika, Charles Lee Ray, Nika possessed by Charles Lee Ray, Nika pretending to be possessed by Charles Lee Ray, and now finally, Nika possessed by Charles Lee Ray pretending to be Nika. Glad we got this Amazing. moment. Amazing. Just so I could play every iteration. Since Devin broke up with him, Jake decides to run away from home. But at the train station, he sees a good guy doll in transit. Using money he stole from Logan, he pays the delivery guy to find out that it's going to Charles Lee Ray's old home. After giving the doll the you'd best not be possessed test, he takes it to Lexi. They realize that Devin was also headed to Charles Lee Ray's old home. What they don't know yet is that Devin's not alone. A drunken Logan stumbles upstairs and tries to talk to Junior, only to find his son sitting with a doll. This pivotal confrontation begins with a great head spin, during which Chucky changes his face from evil to undercover. Hi, I'm Chucky, and I'm your friend till the end. Heidi ho Ha ha ha. Junior puts Chucky in between him and his dad and allows the doll to do the talking for him. You sure drink a lot. Just like Uncle Lucas. I like the new good guy voice performance by child actor Nick A. Fisher. It sounds enough like Eden Gross's from the original films, yeah. but with its own personal style. It's hilarious when they use it for the finale's opening recap. Previously on fucking Chucky. <laughs> it's a great contrast to Chucky's real voice. Get your fucking hands off me. Chucky forces Logan out of the room and keeps talking as though he's a ventriloquist dummy. This is honestly another tragedy for Junior Wheeler. He can't mm -hmm. even have his own catharsis with his dad. It has to go through Chucky. Chucky, who's exploiting his alienation and using Bree's apparent suicide as a final wedge. Junior's storyline really works as an exploration of how young, disaffected people, usually boys, can be taken advantage of and turned to violence. Chucky tried that with Jake and failed, but with Junior he succeeds. The kid pushes his dad and knocks the camera sideways. Then he takes that Chucky doll and, in another homage to magic, beats his dad down. Junior uses the good guy to murder his father Logan, which Chucky seems absolutely thrilled about. He's never been used as a weapon before. Mostly though, Chucky's happy to have finally gotten a kid to kill someone. You have no idea how hard it's been getting one of you little shits to step the fuck up and play. Turns out a kill like this was needed to kick his big plans into motion, or more specifically, put into motion a whole army of other Chucky dolls. Devin sees firsthand that the cult of Chucky is alive and well, and we thought three Chuckies was a lot. As always, the true stars of Chucky are the puppeteers. They're this interesting combination of actors and gearheads. The team was once again led by Tony Gardner, who was excited to return to the Chucky family under Don Mancini. All the usual techniques and technologies were used, with a lot of green performances like they mastered in Cult. I honestly think this is the best the doll has ever looked. If not in design, then for sure in its performance. Baby stabs to Oliver notwithstanding. The puppeteers had to be on their game even more so than usual, since they didn't get to do as many takes as they would during a film shoot. We have to be really well rehearsed because we don't get the chance to mess around on camera. Andy arrives at Junior's house after getting the address from Jake earlier. Junior and Chucky see his arrival through the window. Dude's almost as short as you. 
I know, right? <laughs> Aw, how are you about to do Alex Vincent like that, man? There's a suspenseful up. sequence where Junior lets Andy in and he looks around, but ultimately, he doesn't find nary a Chucky or a corpse. After he leaves, the ginger ghoulie uncraps himself from his hiding spot. He didn't want to deal with Andy's gun. I hate guns. They're like my Achilles heel, along with axes, fire, and those big industrial-sized fans. <laughs> Always love the adherence to continuity. Chucky mm -hmm. has, in fact, died because of guns, axes, yep. fire, yep. and yep. those big industrial-sized fans. Yep. Lexi and Jake try to figure out why Chucky wants one of them to kill somebody. I mean, it's part of some voodoo spell. Hey, that's exactly right, kid. As much as Mancini personally doesn't like the voodoo element, he won't ignore that it's canon. The voodoo that created the Chucky army also worked on the good guy from the train station. He's activated like some kind of Dolchurian candidate and attacks them, remembering the reference that slipped in early earlier Chucky's mind and seed. Here's Chucky. Oh my fucking god, that was awesome! So Holy good. good lord, they make it these dolls It was amazing, so I blood. love it. It is absolutely grotesque. The doll was obliterated by Kyle. I'm Kyle. She's Kyle. Kyle's he got the Kyle. lowdown on Chucky's soul splintering spell, like what its limitations are. Only good guy dolls. It has to be an identical vessel. Except for Nika. Yeah, poor Nika. I know. Whack. She says that if Chucky can corrupt an innocent and make them kill somebody, it'll allow him to create an army. This may seem out of nowhere, but it's not entirely. After all, he did try to get Nika to kill Dr. Foley in Cult. You know you want to. And besides, this franchise occasionally adds new rules. We can roll with it. Another new rule? Sometimes you gotta drug teenagers for their own good. Uh, don't live by that rule, though. No, Kyle's just trying don't. to keep these kids safe, <laughs> so she puts them to Betty by before leaving to save Devin. Tiffany gets home and finds Nika on the ground, only it's not Nika, it's Charles, and he got them kicking powers. There these two go fighting again. How many times have I killed you? <laughs> Is it three? Oh, I got you. It's four, four if, if you, you count, count human, human bodies, bodies and doll bodies. bodies. Yeah, yeah, that's what I I have. The yep. tiff with Tiff is interrupted by Junior and a nicer Chucky. And I'm kind of used to having her around. Sweet face. Once again, Don Mancini wields multiple Chuckies to hilarious effect. Fuck you, Chucky. Thank you, Chucky. In certain scenes like this one, Chucky's played by little kids. Jennifer Tilly found this kid named Jacob excruciatingly cute. Now, I experienced oh my pure goodness. joy. Yeah. My shriveled ovary just sort of sprang back to life. <laughs> In my months <laughs> making the Chucky recounts, I've seen lots of footage of the cast having a blast. Especially Fiona and Jennifer Tilly. They're a fucking riot together. It was nice to see the new, younger cast members having just as good a time on set, and that the adults and kids were both complimentary of and intimidated by each other. Yeah, I was a little intimidated. I was like, oh my god, they're so cool and professional and really good at what they do. I hope they don't think I'm a big dork, you know? <laughs> yeah, totally. And also, when you guys are all together, like, yeah. with your inside jokes and handshakes or whatever, it's very intimidating. Yeah, we get catapulted back to high school. It's like, there's the popular crowd. Maybe they'll let me go. They like talk hey to them. Guys. Yeah. Hey. Tiffany shows her new guests the company she's been keeping. Not just the captive Devin, but also an army of Chuckies, thanks to Junior having killed his dad. Bang up, Job there, June. Your best friend's tied up, and now you gotta hang out with boomers. We're gonna party like it's 1999. <laughs> What's that mean? I love the pet-esque <laughs> scene with all these Chuckies being line. rallied as they discuss if there should be a lower age limit for their victims. No babies. We're not savages. It's a spirited debate. Could you define baby? It culminates in a DS eerie chorus of Chucky laughs. <laughs>, 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 <laughs> They'll have a gay old time! Just like with Buzzcut Chucky and Cult, Brad Dorif uses a higher pitched voice when playing the newly born Chuckies to help give them an air of innocence that probably isn't deserved. There are so many Chuckies in this scene, they had to fill the background with Trick or Treat Studios dolls, since it'd oh. be too costly to make that many animatronics. Sure. Trick or Treat Studios makes the consumer grade Chucky dolls that I've been using in the background of the recounts. Production also used a Trick or Treat Chucky body for the one Kyle shot and killed. They just stuck a very meaty head on top. The Chucky army is loaded up and taken away on a truck, leaving the party down to only two Chuckies. They're more interested in each other than poor old Tiffany, who gets jealous and yells at them. Things get physical, knocking Nika back into control, and Doll Chucky don't like to see that. He tells Tiff to kill Chuck Nika, saying they don't need the Chucky inside of her. There's 72 more of me on that truck.
truck, noting that very exact number. Thank you, Chucky. <laughs> Tiffany refuses to because she likes Nika, so she jumps on the doll and ruthlessly decapitates it. Though she gets his head off, the doll's not dead yet, and she teases it by revealing she's the one who called the cops back in 88. He responds with anger in a callback. I'm gonna get you no matter what! I'm gonna get you no matter what! Yep. With one quote of her mother, Tiffany throws the Chucky head away. I adore Tilly's unhinged performance here. I'm gonna make her go nighty night! Tiffany is such a scary character when she plays everything off like it's a fun game. Oh, I see a little foot. <laughs> <laughs> that was fun. Tiffany knocks Nika out and forces Junior to tie her up. Then she rigs a booby trap and mentions her kid by name for the first time since Seed. My darling Glenda gave it to me. They have exquisite taste. Exquisite taste in explosives, evidently, since this is a bomb for when Andy comes a-knockin'. They leave with Junior keeping one doll for himself. Okay, you can keep them but you gotta clean up the mess. And them dolls are messy. Just look at the decapitated one, who's currently directing its body to get up and murder Devin. Kill the twink. Oh my god. Devin is saved by Andy, who says he came in through the window. But after he unties Devin, they hear Kyle arrive outside. With Chucky using his good guy voice, she's lured to the booby-trapped front door. When she opens it, it trips a laser and some fade-outs, and sets off an explosion that blows the house up. I'm gonna count the Chucky head as a kill for now, but that's it. Any other kills are TBD. Jake yep. and Lexi wake up from their drug coma and learn about the house explosion. And yes, the news story says fatalities, plural, but I don't know what to make of that yet. Show me the proof! In any case, Same. despite a brief emotional fake out, it's confirmed right away that Devin is still alive, which earns him a big old kiss. It's time for the Frankenstein charity screening, and Mayor Cross knows how to bring in the celebs. Oscar nominated actress and professional poker player, Jennifer Tilly! Fuck yeah, respect that chip play. Hell this yeah. must be an exciting moment for Tiffany. She's been dressing Jennifer Tilly more elegantly, as seen with her Tippi Hedren inspired outfit in Cult. She wants to rise above the actress's status from when she was making B movies in Seed. Jennifer for Tilly, before Tiffany entered her body, was actually a B-list actress, and Tiffany's very <laughs> ambitious. She's aspirational, as they say. She wants to be an A-list actress. Jennifer Tilfany announces that she's sending out the 72 Chucky dolls to needful children around the country. Except for this one. Caroline can have him. I'm sure one measly little sick child can take care of himself. Lexi is lured into the building by Junior and Chucky, who draw her deeper and deeper backstage. They wind up behind the screen as the movie gets going for the audience. I love that Frankenstein is the centerpiece of this climax, especially when Chucky gives commentary as the monster accidentally kills the little girl. This is my favorite part. Chuck can only laugh at killing for so long before he wants to do it himself, so he sneaks beneath the seats and stabs upward. The next time we see Nathan, he's bleeding out the mouth in a yeah. kill that makes no sense to me, but hey, we get a bloody popcorn bit out of it. Pretty gross. Michelle yep. screams, kicking off a killing extravaganza. Counting through the cuts, I saw six people get stabbed in the butt during this ordeal. Later, a wide shot lingers on most of the seats, and it also shows six bodies plus <laughs> Nathan. Three more bodies are shown in the aisle when Jake and Devin arrive, and one final shot shows one new body blurry in the background, yep. giving this massacre a final tally of 10 kills after Nathan. Devin extracts Caroline from the theater, poor kid, as Jake confronts Chucky for their final showdown. He gives a wonderful bad guy monologue and says that he'll live on forever. No one will remember the victims' names. All they'll remember is the number of people I killed. My body count. Speaking from experience, that is true. Jakey yep. makes a run for it, but Chucky slashes him down, then lampshades a common criticism of the character. You're thinking, how could a little doll possibly be so strong? Does it make any sense? He gives a simple explanation. His strength comes from Dumbala. We should have known. As the chaos unfolds, Lexi learns that Junior killed his dad. He says killing has made him braver and bigger. He's a strong boy now. She makes an impassioned plea to Junior and says he isn't really the monster he's become. When Chucky cheers for Junior to kill his ex-girlfriend, the monster turns on its master and puts a knife in Chucky's chest. Damn, some of these dolls die way easier than others. But, ah, uh, surprise! Junior has a knife in yeah. his chest, too. His tragic character arc yeah. comes to a tragic end. As the Chucky series Hi, shows, Junior. it's not afraid to kill a teenager. Jake mashes his buttons faster than Chucky, so he overpowers the doll. He yells at Chucky for killing his dad, Oh, yeah, they they had to uh, take the audio out of this because it was a copyright claim. Sad. It, it, it's so dumb because of just how short it is. And once that copyright claim comes in, it takes everything, no matter the length of it.
which is Stand really, really dumb. in 2003 by squeezing his eyes out. Holy shit, that is a nasty ass doll kill. You wild Chucky series in a way I love. Jake and Devin embrace and they walk off together. The end. It's a universal picture, except it's not the end. We still need to wrap some shit up. Jake and Devin learn that Junior's dead. Yeah, I know, womp womp. Tiffany sends off the Chucky of Chucky's, but it gets hijacked by Andy who survived the house explosion. He gives a T2 thumbs up to the kids, then flips off Tiffany as he drives by her car that he's disabled. Good job, Andy. You saved the day. Yeah, Except for one of. little doll-sized problem. Andy, I don't think we've had the pleasure. I'm Tiffany, the doll, not the person. <laughs> It's complicated. Hell yeah! We finally get a return of Tiffany the doll after seeing her in the back seat at the end of Cult. Mm -hmm. And as far as Tiffany the person goes, um, I can't say I like her anymore. Because oh. she wakes up Nika and says yeah. that she needed to neutralize Whoa. the Chucky inside her. To do so, she's cut off all of Nika's limbs. Yep. Just about Johnny got his gunder. Yep. Come on, Don. Nika's been through so much already. Yep. This feels like a step too far into cruelty. And I don't know how it can be fixed. Miss Fairchild is freed because that didn't really go anywhere, and the trio of friends visit the Hackensack Cemetery, which has got to be running out of room. They hug, not noticing a nearby leather glove. Is it Kyle? Someone else? Only time will tell. Mm -hmm. How many kills did Ch- uh, Hello. Hello. Uh, hello. I Hi. didn't see you there. Oh. Been here like an hour, dude. Yeah, I'm what? Chucky. I know. And I hope yep. you enjoyed my new show. Well, I did, but Same. why are you- Speaking of who died, let's review, shall we? What? Mother what? Chucker, gonna, you want to come and take my job? Yeah, Fine, let's duke it out at the numbers. All right. All right, what do you got, Chuck? A grand total of 21 victims. What is that, just the people you killed? Okay, listen, man, I know you can kill, but trust me, I can count. First off, don't include the cat. Humanoids only. Sorry, kitty. Next, looks like you count seven bodies in the theater, including Nathan, which does match the long shot when they leave, but it doesn't account for the three bodies seen in the aisle or the True. one additional seated body seen in another shot. You count the explosion, which I don't want to do yet, because I didn't see Kyle's body. And looks like you're taking credit for Logan's kill, which I'll ultimately accredit to Junior. You didn't count the flashback kills, which, I mean, you gotta, man. And because of your ego or whatever, you didn't count any of the Chucky deaths. Here, let me show you how it's done. By my count, there were 34 kills in Chucky Season 1. 24 of those victims were men or Chuckies, while only 10 were women. Not very equitable, but it is a good guy pie. Chucky added 26 kills to his personal total, with 23 by himself and 3 together with Tiff. Those kills consisted of one electrocution, a neck snap, two miscellaneous from the defenestration and the drug cocktail, and a whopping 22 kills with bladed objects. One day I should really break those down. In addition to her three joint custody kills, Tiffany had one additional kill on her own, her old standby with a nail file, making all four of her kills done with bladed objects. At the end of season one, this is how the dolls stack up. Nice. You now I hope Glenn slash Glendo will return to the chart in season two. The TV series had more than twice the number of kills as any movie, but of course, it was also at least four times as long. Sure. Speaking of which, with a season of eight episodes, we had on average four and a quarter kills per episode. Boom, bitch! That's Hell how you yeah. count! I'll give the golden chainsaw for coolest kill to Brie Wheeler. The whole scene is so goddamn devastating while mm -hmm. also beautiful, the combination yeah. that Mancini is always striving for. My one complaint is that it happens in the middle of the episode instead of the end. With a death this powerful, I would have preferred an entire week to digest it. Agreed. Dull machete for lamest kill will go to Nathan Cross. So what, Chucky stabbed this guy's bud and he didn't yell out or anything? He just sat there and died, bleeding through his mouth? Come on, get out of here. And champion chuckle for funniest part has loads of options because this show is hilarious. You've got iconic lines like Chucky talking about his kid. Gender fluid. And hilarious exchanges between Chucky and Caroline. Mommy says real killing is bad. Mommy's working her way up my list pretty fucking quick. <laughs> there are plenty of awesome moments between multiple Chuckies again, and of course, tons of times that Jennifer Tilly made me laugh aloud. Ooh, I see a little foot. But I'll give the award to the line that gave me the biggest shocked laugh of the show. Get up till the twink. 
And that's it. The Chucky TV series premiered in 2021 and was a big hit, getting picked up for a second season. That second season is airing right now on Sci-Fi and USA. And every Wednesday, you can catch an after show here on Dead Meat, oh. published at 10 p.m. Eastern, 7 p.m. Pacific. We've already released the first one, where Chelsea and I chatted with Don Mancini. It's an amazing opportunity for us because we love this franchise dearly. And I'll Same. definitely cover season two on The Kill Count sometime in the future. Until then, I'm James A. Janice. This has been The Kill Count. Thanks a lot for watching this Kill Count. Our time with Chucky on The Kill Count is at an end for now. But again, check out the after show each week after a new episode premieres. I will. Big thanks to Kira Gardner for giving me this shirt. I wasn't actually on the crew for Chucky season one, but her dad was, obviously. This feels like stolen valor, kind of. She also lent me that third Chucky doll I used in Cult of Chucky. I think oh. that one was like screen used, which is why it looks so much better than these trick or treat dolls, which okay. are still good. Again, no Kill Count trailers for now, just cause we're all busy, but the next sure. episode will be Haunt. I wanna thank some patrons like Megan Gitz, Hunter Kennedy, Hayden Boyer, Giselle G, Daniel Tursky, Shelby Buttons 23, Cat Sweaters, Brandon Terry, and Brando Hempo. Thanks everyone. Be good people. Yeah, this was so much fun. I originally loved this show for all of the Easter eggs that we found like throughout the series from all these just referencing literally every single movie leading up until this point and then him pointing out just how much more there was than I didn't even know about, which makes me appreciate it more. It's one thing I love with these kill counts uh, when I already enjoyed the movie, but then watching this kill count and see how much more love and care went into it, how much more, how many more references, uh, just how much more attention to detail that there was. And it's something that I say like all the time. I love shows, movies, whatever, that really um, reward the people who, pay attention to detail and i did my best to pay attention to every little thing and even then i missed it but again i loved it that much more because of it and speaking on the show itself again wonderful uh the cast was great keep on free, uh, the getting forgetting the girl who played nika but her versatility throughout this entire season was just phenomenal uh, all the kids did a great job too i'm always amazed at uh, how well these child actors end up performing and just like all like the returns and everything else was just like oh my god i love seeing them in this show and i can't wait to dive into season two but uh, that's gonna do it for me here before i go though i want to give a huge shout out to all of my five dollar now supporters on patreon luchador cruising wolverine 310 multi-disturbed 666 jordan bird lauren davenport caster cronage amber k ray Membright, joshi Chris Curtis, and Jeremiah McCarroll. And if you two look at your name, man, I think each and every one of my videos, plus many other fun goodies, maybe have me react to a past kill count or two, please head on over to patreon.com slash reactor. Link will be right there. And in the description with many different tiers for you to choose from. And if you'd like to have an easier way to get in contact with me, maybe talk about the kill count, maybe talk a little bit about Chucky, you can head on over and join the channel Discord, where you can chat with others about other reactions that I've done, find out just a little bit more about me, and then find out about this week's reaction schedule. And with that being said, comment down below. Let me know what did you think about season one of Chucky. Please leave a like if you enjoyed. Also, once you bash reaction, I've done the other Dead Me videos. A nice playlist right over there for you. Share this video. Subscribe if you haven't subscribed already. Read notification bell because we put new videos every single day. And I'll see you guys next time. <laughs>